Plexus was a plugin for After Effects that came out in 2012. It took the motion design world by storm. It was used whenever something needed a bit of a techie feel. And it also coincided with the boom in futuristic UI design. Plexus rode this wave to being on pretty much every spaceship UI in film, and it even made it onto a James Bond film. See, Plexus was deceptively simple. It connected points with lines. But beyond that, within a couple of years, it became a powerhouse that allowed you to group meshes and deform points in crazy and most importantly, configurable ways. It's how I created these scenes for the documentary, The Connection. So it holds a, a place in my heart and I've been meaning to recreate it inside Unreal for a very long time. But doing that is, is not entirely simple. And yes, Unreal does have those new fancy motion design tools, and they are amazing. But they currently can't do everything that I need. Plus, all these motion design tools actually do run on Niagara. And they do what Plexus does, which is they uh, hide a lot of stuff and make a lot of more complex things easier to access. But, of course, that means that if you need to do something outside of that, it's very, very hard to break it apart and make it do what you want. If you've not heard of Niagara before, it is the ridiculously powerful particle system built into Unreal. Niagara lets you do anything, but because it allows you to do anything, you have to know where to look, and often when you're trying to create special effects, you need to know how to code using custom modules called scratch pads. Plexus really only had the Plexus look. Its controls are dedicated to a specific set of tasks that are relatively difficult to do inside Niagara. For example, Plexus allows you to control how the points are joined with the proximity control, which I've only really just recently come across how to do inside Niagara. Thank you, Enrique Ventura. And it requires code to construct matrices and other fun stuff. And when I say fun stuff, it is actually fun, but I'll have to do this over a few videos. I want to recreate Plexus, but I also want to start back far enough that even if you've never used Niagara, you'll be able to follow along. We'll start from the very beginning by unpacking and modifying standard presets for Niagara, and then we'll go into starting to customize it with our own data. And then after that, well, it gets a bit fuzzy because I'm not there yet. There is unlimited potential, but I don't know how long it's gonna take me to get there. With that out of the way though, let's jump into Unreal for part one. Now, once we're in Unreal, you don't necessarily have to enable any plugins, but uh, let's just go and search for Niagara and make sure that, you know, Niagara obviously is ticked, but Niagara Fluids, let's tick that on just to be a bit future-proof. With that all done, we're gonna start in a blank folder here. Right click, let's create a level called L underscore Niagara Plexus. We're going to create a Niagara system and once we're here, we're going to actually scroll down past all of the normal presets, and we're going to find the preset called Ribbon Link Order. Click Create, and we're going to name that NS Niagara Plexus. And just before we jump in, we're going to right click, create a new material, call that M Simple Particle Color. And that is going to allow us to just uh, have a very simple material that takes the particle color and puts it onto a mesh. So we've created our very simple particle color material. Double click on that. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to right click and search for particle color. And we're just going to put that straight into the base color of this particle. Um, to have materials be used with Niagara, you're going to have to just scroll down to uh, usage, and then we want to use it with mesh particles, Niagara sprites, and Niagara ribbons, and Niagara mesh particles. So a few uses there. Hit apply, save, and close that down. Now let's open up this level, Niagara Plexus, and we're going to drag in uh, Niagara Plexus system. 
and you can already see that it is doing stuff. So I'll just zero that position out and holding down right click in the viewport, I'm gonna use W, A, S, and D, and Q and E to just navigate around. Okay, so we've got obviously some particles and they're obviously getting joined by, I'm gonna assume ribbons because it's called the ribbon link order. To see how it's doing this, let's double click on this NS Niagara Plexus system. And we come into the Niagara interface. It's separate, but very, very familiar to the rest of Unreal, but it uses a lot of node colors that we haven't seen yet. We've got our system here. That's like overalls kind of settings. Uh, how long does this whole thing run for and or loop? And then you've got individual emitters. You can have multiple emitters. They can talk to each other. They can do really funky stuff. Uh, for example, with a fireworks display, you might have one emitter be the initial um, particle burst. And then the next one might be the explosions that happen at the end of the lifespan of the first firework. So we're gonna have a look at this emitter first. And by clicking on it, it will bring up all of the general details in the details panel. We're gonna have a look at these emitter properties and we're just going to set the SIM target to be GPU compute. And you can now see some very helpful parts of Niagara in that like whenever it has an error, it's not going to crash on you, but it is going to just warn you that something's wrong and uh, please fix this. So it says it's missing fixed bounds. We can come down here to the calculate bounds mode, change it to fixed. And we're going to set that to maybe a minimum of a thousand in each direction. And we're going to set the maximum to a thousand. And that should be enough. As we look through this emitter, you can see that there are sections and inside sections, there are subheadings. These are actually called modules. And Niagara has grouped them into categories, which makes sense for the way that it calculates things. You can read them from top to bottom and actually see the calculations it goes through to find the position and attributes of each particle. It starts off with the emitter, which is like setting up the rules of how it produces particles. In this case, it's got a spawn burst instantaneous producing 24 particles just in one go. And then the particle spawn is run every single time a particle is birthed. So we initialize the particle with various items. We initialize it in the shape of a sphere with this radius. And then we do some funny stuff. And finally we get to the ribbon renderer. That's what is allowing us to see the attributes of the particles. Currently it's a ribbon renderer and that's a renderer that connects all of the different particles as it goes through the order. It's connecting it with a plane mesh, but we can actually change that now to something that's a little bit more Plexus-like. Let's change the shape to a tube with 16 subdivisions. Now, currently we have a default material there. So let's just click the down arrow and search for M underscore simple particle color and now we can use the material that we created earlier. But you can see it's actually giving us some shiny reflections, which isn't really like Plexus. So if I just double click on this material, it'll take us to the material editor. I'm gonna select the main material and I'm gonna change the shading model to unlit. You can see everything goes black and that's because on unlit materials, the base color doesn't do anything. You have to connect the color you want to the emissive color. Now it goes back to white. Hit apply and then save. And up the top, you've got tabs. Over on the left is our Niagara system. So I'm just going to close this simple particle color. We can see we've got our tubes that are now white and flat kind of not exactly what I'm after because they look really big. So let's come back to where it says initialize particle. Here we can see that the ribbon width has already been set to 35. We're going to drop that down to let's say four. Now in initialize particle, we've got all these different ways that we can set each property. Unset means that it just stays with the default or doesn't have a value. 
We can set it to uniform for setting up a particular value, but in other ones, it, they call it direct set as opposed to uniform. You could also set it to a random, which is like a shortcut for giving us just a value between a minimum and a maximum. For example, let's set this color mode to random hue sat value. That allows you to choose a certain color and then given a minimum and maximum shift in the hue, saturation and value will happen around that color that you've chosen. I think that looks pretty good. But one thing is, is that you can see it changes about every half a second. That's because up here in the emitter state, the initial loop is set to 0 0.5. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set that to 5, and I'm also going to set the initialized particle lifetime to 5 so that they line up. Now when they reset, you'll be able to see that the change of color coincides with the loop every five seconds. Now we have some lovely colors that fade from particle to particle thanks to that material we created earlier. So following the flow of the system down a little bit more, you can see that initialized particle happens and then it initializes into the shape of a sphere. This sphere has a radius of 150. So as we increase it or decrease it, you can see that the sphere changes. And you'll notice that it's set to uniform distribution. If we hit to random, every time the loop resets, it will choose a new place on the sphere to put the particles. Set to uniform, it will choose the same place with the same index every time. That's actually very important for the next module in this stack, which is slightly custom, but uh, nothing too complex. If you remember, we have already set up the particles attributes. That's like their location, color, size. Later on, we can actually just set them to whatever we want or pull bits of data from elsewhere and copy them onto various attributes. That's what this is doing here. It is setting the particles ribbon link order from the normalized execution index. And that's basically a long way of saying, take the order we set up in the shape location and use that for the ribbon link order. So that way, this uniform distribution index gets used to connect all the particles using these tubes. In fact, let's just create it from scratch. So I can delete that, it won't break it, but we're going to go to set new or existing parameter directly. We're going to click this plus button here and search for ribbon link order. Now we can either just set it directly or we can say copy the normalized exec index, which is what it had before. And that's basically recreated it from scratch where it's copying the normalized exec index onto the ribbon link order. And I know what you're thinking, that's a lot of like big words and how would you even know what to search for? The best advice I can give you is that if you live in Niagara for a little while, just trying different things and searching for all of the different kind of attributes, you'll be able to find the language that Niagara uses and the conventions that they use to copy bits of data over to different places. And once you start creating more Niagara systems, you'll start recognizing some common attribute names or data sources that will probably get you to where you need to go 90% of the time. For the moment, we'll just keep on moving with the tutorial, but just know that if it's confusing now, the more time you spend with it, the less confusing it will get. Moving down, there's not too much in the particle update section. This doesn't say too much. There is another set particles ribbon link order, which actually takes it from a random range float, which is fun to see because now you can see that it will apply a random float between zero and one to the different particles. And the particles are remaining the same, but the connection order between them is randomized each time. We'll turn that off to stop it jumping around. And you'll see that all of the attributes in the particles have been set and the renderer is what shows it to us. Um, a great example of how the data is actually just flowing through this stack is the fact that we're seeing these colors being passed through to the mesh. The ribbon renderer is using the material which is getting the particle color and applying it at each point. So we have some particles and we've been able to join them, but it's not quite plexus yet, obviously. We need some dots. So to do that, we're going to 
click the plus button next to render and we're going to choose mesh renderer. Now you can see at each particle, it is created what is called a nomon. <laughs> and you can see that because it's the default mesh that appears when you add the mesh renderer. Let's just click the down arrow and search for one unit. And we're gonna change it to the one unit sphere, which is obviously very, very small. And we're going to click that down arrow and up the scale to let's say 10, maybe five. Okay, that's pretty good. And we're going to change our material by enabling the material overrides adding an override material. And inside here, we're going to click the down arrow and again, search for our simple particle color. Choose it. And it should be the same color as the tubes. Just to go fully retro, I'm just gonna go back to my initialized particle and turn off this color mode by clicking the reset to default value and changing it to white. There we go. That's that's like base plexus, but it doesn't really have that much life yet. It's just a static form with connected dots. So what we can do is we can start to add some kind of movement to the dots. Probably the fastest way to do that for this tutorial is just by in the particle update, we click the plus button and we're going to scroll down and add forces. There's heaps of different types of forces, but what we're going to be doing is adding a curl noise force. And just like before, we can see that there's an error, but Niagara being helpful, it will actually explain it to you and then also provide you with a one click button to fix it. Basically the curl noise module will add a force to the particle, but you need another module to take that force and combine it with the velocity to calculate a final position. That module is called solve forces and velocity. So we can just click fix issue and then we'll add it just after this. And now we can see our particles moving. So this is looking a lot more like Plexus, but if you've used Plexus, you know just how much is missing from it. Like, can we connect more than one dot at a time? Can we control the movement of these dots in any way? Uh, how do you stop the movement from happening? Like this curl noise is really uncontrollable. It doesn't actually return back to the initial position. It just sets the dots in motion. All of that and more will be in the future videos, but we're going to have to leave it there for the moment. So I'll see you in the next one.